Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we will discuss passive activity loss limits. Passive activity loss limit falls under the umbrella of investor losses. So if the investor incur losses, how much of those losses can we deduct? Now, in order to understand the passive activity loss, we have to understand what is called at-risk limits for investors. In the prior session, we did cover the at-risk limit. It's basically, what is, what is the money? What is the capital? What is the wealth that is exposed for an investor? And that's the amount that the investor can deduct. So first, we have to determine how much are you at risk at? And we did determine this in the prior session, basically what cash you you invested in the business, any property you contributed, any loans you took out and you're personally liable, so on and so forth. So first we have to determine, are you at risk? So do you have basically money on the line, money at risk? If that's the case, yes, you might have losses that you can deduct. The next thing we have to figure out is, is your activity passive or active? Why do we have to do that? Also, if you remember from the prior session, the IRS looks at your income, bucket your income in three buckets, put them in three buckets, active income, portfolio income, and passive income. You need to understand what is active income versus passive income. Well, what is active income? Well, active income is income that's generated by the taxpayer through the active engagement in a specific activity. Like what? We talked about this in the prior session, but let's do it again. Salaries and wages, you are earning, you are actively earning your money. Guarantees payment, business income from activities in which the taxpayer materially participate. And we're going to spend a little bit more time in this session defining what materially participate is. Simply put, just to keep it simple, let's assume you own a farm and you work on that farm. Guess what? You're the owner of the business and you actively cultivate the land, plant the land, sow the land, so on and so forth. So you are active. Okay. Now we could also have a portfolio income. And this is when your money is working for you. Investment income, capital gains, interest income, dividend income, annuity and royalty. Basically, your money is working for you in form of investment. That's fine too. It's called portfolio income. Now, we also have what we called passive income. Also, it's an income from trade, business, or income producing activity. So notice, just like active income through active engagement in specific activity in a trade in which the taxpayer does not materially participate. Let's go back to my farm example. Let's assume I own a farm, but you know what? I never visit that farm. I don't plant any fruit or vegetables, or plow the land, or anything like this. I just, I, I invest my money, and someone else takes care of it, and at the end of the year, they will send me a statement. Let's assume I own 20%. They will allocate 20% of the profit or the loss to my account. So what am I here? I am a passive. I am a passive investor here. I don't participate. So my income is passive, not active. Now, why do we have to know about this passive income? Well, passive income can be used as a tax shelter. Simply put, if you remember the story I told you back in the 80s, real estate rental business assumed to be passive because what was happening is this. Many people with high income, with a lot of W-2 income or active business income, what they would do, they will buy real estate property and they would rent it out. And as a result, they will generate losses but they were not actively participating. So simply put, the IRS says you cannot take your losses from a passive activity and offset your income, your active income. So when we talk about passive income, we always assume that real estate rental business is assume it's a passive. And there are two exceptions. We'll talk about those two exceptions later. Now, if you have a Schedule C, if you have a business like a Schedule C business, you, you could be passive or active. If you have an S, if you're if you are a shareholder in an S corporation, a partner, you can be passive or active. So it depends. But rental real estate is considered always passive. So passive is if a taxpayer does not work on a regular, continuous, and substantial basis in the business. Remember, I own the farm, but I don't, I don't know anything about that farm. I don't know anything about the farming business. Well, guess what? I, am, I have a passive income here if there's any income and passive loss for that matter. So if I don't do so, 
in the business, the losses are considered to be passive. What does that mean? Well, if the losses are passive, they are generally not deductible in the absence of passive income. So I have passive losses. That's great. I can only, I can only offset them against passive income. So I have to have a passive income in order to use my passive losses. Now, again, if you remember in the prior session, I gave you this example. I'm going to show you the picture real quick. Remember, I told you we have two doctors and a lawyer. And what did they do? They, they purchased a shopping center and they rented out and they generate losses. So that's why rental business, especially real estate rental, is always assumed to be passive. Unless you have two exceptions, we'll, we'll talk about those later. But what is in general a passive activity? And this is what we need to focus on because if we know what, a, if we can define what a passive activity is, then we know what a passive income or passive loss for that matter. Before we define passive activity, I have an announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course, such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses, broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. So, do we have a passive activity? So, is this a passive activity? To determine whether we have a passive activity or not, we have to address three questions. And the first one is, what is an activity? What constitute an activity? What is the taxpayer's material participation? And remember, I told you we're going to talk more about material participation, and that later is now, soon. And the third thing, and when is an activity a rental activity? Simply put, if it's a rental activity, what do we have to do? And that's going to be an easy answer here with the two exceptions. Starting with the first of the three questions, identification of an activity. Well, under the Treasury regulation, which is the IRS follow, an activity is defined as one or more trade or business activities or rental activities that form an appropriate economic unit for the purpose of measuring the taxpayer's gain and losses. Simply put, some sort of a business unit where you are measuring your gain or losses. It could be more than one, it could be one, you can combine them, so on and so forth. So when you're identifying an activity or group or grouping of various activities together, all the relevant factors and circumstances can be considered. So you could have one unit or multiple unit grouped together or separate. Once activities are grouped, and we're, you're going to see why that's important, a regrouping generally is not allowed unless the original grouping was clearly inappropriate or the fact or the circumstances have materially changed. So if you group two or three business together and told them, this, the, I'm going to consider this one unit, then you change your mind. You have to justify it. Or if you have them separate, then you change your mind. You're going to have to justify it. So it's allowed that you have to justify it. But let's look at some, some examples to illustrate the importance of grouping, uh, grouping the business unit. Let's assume Maggie owns a business with two separate units, X and Y. Maggie per materially participated in managing X, but does not get involved in Y. So simply put, we're going to see what materially participate is. But for now, just in other words, she runs the business on a day-to-day -day basis. She makes all the decisions. Um, she hire, fire, make pricing decisions, so on and so forth. For the current year, the X, the unit X generated income of 100,000. This is where Maggie participates. While unit Y reported a net loss. Why? Because Maggie does not participate. She's, she's silent in that unit. If Maggie treats X and Y units as component of the same activity, then she can lose, she can use the loss reported in Y, which is 37,000, to offset the income generated in X. So if they are one unit, we would report them together, we net them out. They're considered one unit. However, if Maggie is not allowed or it doesn't make any business sense or just it, it clearly they're not related to treat the two unit as a single activity, then here's what's going to happen. Maggie will have 100,000 of active income because remember for unit X, Maggie is mater materially participating and a passive loss of 437 from unit Y. What can we do with this passive loss of 37,000? Nothing for this year. We have to wait until we have a passive income to offset the loss. Therefore, we'll carry it for future year. Maria owns a vape store and a restaurant in Maryland. I don't recommend vape stores, but that doesn't matter. That's what she wants to do. She also owns a vape store and a restaurant in Boston. 
in deciding how to group her activities, any of the following alternative could be reasonable. How can she do it? Well, she can say, I'm going to group all four activities together as she'll the sole owner. So this is grouping based on the owner's identity. Or she can group the activities in Maryland together and the activities in Boston together. And she's going to say, I want to group them based on geographical areas. Or she can group them, the vape stores together and restaurants together based on the type of activities. Or she can treat each unit or each activity as a separate standalone activity. Again, it makes a difference whether, whether you have each one is treated as passive or active when it comes to netting. So that's why you have to be careful. Am I grouped them together? Am I not? Which one is active? Which one is not? So you have to be very careful in how you group them. But the point is you do have that flexibility. Let's talk about material participation, and that's important. Here's what's going to happen. The IRS basically sta state that a taxpayer is considered to be actively participating in an activity if he or she meets one of the following seven material participation tests. You only have to meet one. And you're going to see at the end, you could meet anyone. And we're going to see what does that mean in a moment. The taxpayer participate in the activity more than 500 500 hours during the year. So you can, if you can show you participate in the activity, actively participate more than 500 hours, you are considered to be active. You're done. Two, the taxpayer participation in the activity is substantially all the participation in the activity of all individuals for the year. Well, sometimes you might have a small business and you're by yourself and you don't spend 500 hours, but basically you're the only person that spend hours in that business, whether those 50 or 500, you spend all the hours, now you are considered active because no one else in that business. Then you are active. Who else is running the business if you are not, right? You are active. The taxpayer participate in the activity for more than 100 hours during the year and not less than the participation of any other individual in the activity. So you spend more than 100 and not less and no one is above you. So you're basically running the show. Therefore, you are considered to have active participation. The, tax, the taxpayer's participation in the activity is significant and the taxpayer aggregate participation in all participation activity during the year exceeds 500 hours and the significant participation is more than 100. So, you, so 100 hours you're doing heavy duty and a total of 500. Five, the taxpayer materially participated in the activity for any five years during the last 10 year period. So simply put, in the last 10, you've been, you, you are considered to be materially, participate, materially participating, therefore you assume to have active role. The activity is a personal service activity in which the taxpayer mater, materially participated for any preceding three years. Personal service, lawyers, architect, accountant, and if you are materially participating for any of the three preceding years, you are still running the show. You are an active business owner. Seven, and look at seven. And this is what I was talking about at the beginning. Based on fact and circumstances, the taxpayer participated in the activity on a regular, continuous, and substantial basis. Now, when we say base, based on fact and circumstances, because the IRS cannot think of every possible scenario. So they thought of this scenario as definitely you're an active. But you can al always argue that I am active based on the fact and the circumstances. And you have to prove that because regular, continuous, and substantial is not defined actually in the regulation. So that's why you can argue as long as you can prove to them that you are active, then you are active. Now, bear in mind, investor type of work does not count. So if you're obtaining a loan, raising money, meeting with potential investors, creditor, reviewing financial reports, financial statements for the purpose of investing, in the business, then those are called investor type work and those hours does not count. Let's look at an example. During the current year, John CPA earned a net income of 450,000 from his CPA practice. Additionally, John owned an interest in activities B and D in which he does not materially participate. He incurred the loss of 20,000 from B and a net income of 15,000 from D. Now, John, if he put an additional 50 hours in activity D, it will be treated as a active business, active income. It will be treated as materially participating. Let's see. To determine if John's attempt to meet the material participation standard for D, it's important to understand the tax, the tax consequences. So let's see if that's a good idea. Without the material participation, both activities are treated as passive. And guess what? The loss in B 
may be offset the gain in D. So simply put, if they are both, if they are both, if they are both passive, we can take 15 plus a 20, negative 20 plus 15, and we were able to offset, offset, remove this, and we still have 5,000, but we're able to remove 5,000 of net income. However, if John materially participate in D, and D becomes an active business, then we have a net income that's going to be a report and well, a net income or revenue or profit or income of 15,000 and a loss. Nothing, there's nothing we can do with it because this becomes passive. This, this is, is passive and this, the 15,000 is active. This becomes taxable and there's nothing we can do with this passive loss. So it's in John's best interest given the circumstances not to turn D into an active business because if you do then you cannot you cannot use the twenty thousand dollar of losses that's what we're trying to say here another example Jane an attorney owns a restaurant that reported a net loss in the current year that's fine a restaurant reported a net loss during the year Jane worked 450 hours in managing the restaurant and 20 hours in doing genitorial activities. Her husband, Julian, participated 80 hours in the activities relating, relating to related to marketing and sales. Okay, so let's see if Jane is an active participant and how do we count those hours? Assuming that the activities were not performed to avoid any disallowance of passive activity losses, Jane qualifies, but let's see how she qualifies in the restaurant. She's gonna count her hours and her husband's hour. Simply put, you can count your hours and your husband's hour together. Now, you're saying, hold on a second, that's 5.30. That, that should be right because she also put 20 hours doing genitorial activities. Here's what we're going to have to kind of think about. You have to be managing, actively participating, making decision. Just racking up hours will not count. So doing genitorial activities will not count. Now, what counts and what not counts? Obviously, it's not clear cut. But the point is, if it's not managing, doing doing major amount of the work, making major decision, then it's not managing the business. It's not actively participating. It's important to note that genitorial activities are not included in the activity this is just adding up hours not allowed. For example, also let's assume Jane wants to cut the grass, mow, uh, mow the lawn outside the restaurant. That does not count. That does not count. The third, uh, the three of three is the rental activity and this is easy. Subject to two exceptions, which we'll talk about, all rental activities are automatically considered passive activities because rental activities is what brought, brought all of us into this lesson because rental activities were being abused in the 80s. I talked about this in the prior session where people were buying rental property, generating losses from high interest and depreciation and offsetting those, off, offsetting the losses, uh, offsetting their, taking the losses and offsetting their active income. So we have two exceptions we have to talk about from rental activities, the mom and pop exception and the real estate professional. Starting with the mom and pop, under the mom and pop exception, the taxpayer is allowed to deduct up to 25,000 of net losses from rental real estate activities. And any excess loss is carried forward as a suspended passive activity loss for future year. The deduction amount is reduced by 50% of the taxpayer's AGI in excess of 100,000 and the deduction is completely eliminated at 150. So simply put, up if you make up to 100,000 if you have AGI of 100,000, really it's it's a modified AGI, but no one cares about the M. If your AGI is less than 100,000, you can deduct up to 25,000. Once your AGI, AGI exceeded 100,000, your 25,000 will start to go down until you reach 150. Once you reach 150 in AGI, the government says you're making too much money. You cannot use those losses. You cannot use those losses. A taxpayer who's actively engaged in a and a rental real estate activity and owns at least 10% of the activity is eligible. So you have to own 10% of the activity to be eligible, 10% of the property. And most of these properties are owned 100% by the mom and the pop. Usually what this happened, like for example, I'm, I'm planning on selling my home now, buying a new home. I'm waiting for the real estate market to slow down a little. 
So what I'm going to do, if, this, if the real estate market slow down more than a little, a lot, I'm not going to sell my house. I'm going to keep my house rented out by the new home. So I will be a mom and pop exception. I just, I'm just because of my, I bought a second home. I don't want to sell my current home because the market went down. The market doesn't have to go down. I may just keep the home as a second business, as a, as a second uh, source of income. It's a lot of headache, but this is the point. So these, these people, mom and pop, they own 100% usually of the business, usually. And the active management require an active participation. Here, you don't need material participation, but an active, active participation in making decisions in a significant and bona fide sense. In what sense? You are making decision to run the business. Like what type of a major decision do you make as a landlord? Well, approving tenants, deciding on the rental terms, approving cap, approving capital or repair expenditure. Also, how much to charge. If you're making those decisions, well, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be 500 hours. It doesn't have to be anything. As long as you're making those decisions and you meet the other qualification, guess what? You qualify, not you qualify, in case you have losses, you can use up to 25,000 of losses against your active income. The second exception, you have to be a real, considered a real estate professional. Who are the real estate professional? An individual who provide more than 50 of his or, his or her personal services in real estate business. So basically provide more than half of their time in this business and at least that amount to 750 hours in real estate property business. Now you are considered a real estate professional and his or her income is treated as an active income. What does that mean? If it's active income, that's good because if you have active losses, you can, if you have active losses, you can deduct the active losses against other active income. Now you are, you, your activity is considered active. Like basically it's active income because that you are in the business of real estate. Therefore, any income, any losses, they are treated as active. Now the spouse participation are not taken into account when evaluating whether the taxpayer work more than 750. So just be aware of this in case they added the spouse's hours for to be considered. They are not considered. You cannot use the spouse's hour versus if you go back here, just the reason I'm showing you this is I want to show you the difference between the two spouses here under Jane, her and uh, her and her husband hours were counted. So just be aware of this under the real estate professional, not at all. You are counted separately, but here you combine them for this purpose, for the material participation. Let's go back and finish the real estate professional. Um, also, personal services performed as an employee are not treated as performed in a real, real, real property trade or business unless the employee owns at least 5% of the business. So if you acted as an employee, Let's assume you are running, you know, you're running the credit of the individuals of the tenant. Um, I don't know. You are mowing the lawn. It doesn't matter what you are doing. If you, that doesn't count unless you own 5% of the business, because if you don't own the business and if you are working in the real estate business, but you don't have any ownership, then you're an employee. You cannot be considered a real estate professional. And notice the threshold is pretty low. You only have to own 5% for those, activity to, for those activities to be counted toward your, your 750 hours. Let's take a look at a few examples. We have Mario has an AGI before any consideration of rental property of 120,000. He has a loss from a rental activity in which he actively participate. In addition, he has a passive income of 15,000 from another rental property. So what is the amount of rental activity loss that Mario is allowed to deduct in the current year? Well, let's take a look. First, his AGI is below 150. Uh, so um, we're going to assume that, yeah, we're below 150. Therefore, he qualifies for 25,000, which is good. Let's see what we're going to do. First, Mario can offset the 15,000 of rental loss against the passive income because they are both considered passive. So we'll have a remaining passive loss of 60,000. So basically what we did, we took the 15,000 of income plus minus the rental losses of 75, we are left with 60,000. What can we do with the 60,000? Remember, Mario is in the 120,000 AGI range. So Mario is actively engaged in real act in, in rental activity. Therefore, he, he's eligible for the mom and pop exception, which allows up to 25,000 of passive losses from rental activities against other income. That's the good news. And the good news more is he can deduct it. But the allowance of 25,000 is reduced by half 
have the access of AGI over 100,000. So what's going to happen? We look at the AGI in access of 100,000, which is 20,000. And you can you will take half of that, which is 10,000. As a result, so as a result, I'm sorry, you, you will be reduced by 10,000. As a result, if we have 25,000, reduce it by 10, you are left with 15. Or you can, another way to look at this is, if this is the range, the range is from 100 to 150, and you are 20,000 20, into the range. So 20,000, the, the whole range, just kind of, the whole range is 50,000. This is where you start to lose. The whole range is 50,000. You're 20 over 50 inside the range. So you're 40% inside the range. As you go move inside the range, you would lose your, you would lose your, you will start to lose. So of the 25,000, what, what's going to happen is you're only going to keep 60% of it. Well, let's see what's 25,000 times 60%. 25,000. Whoops, went too many zeros times 0.6. That's 15,000. Therefore, you qualify for 15,000. Or you can take the amount over AGI divided by 2, and that's the amount not allowed. And you can deduct it from the 25. Either or will be good. Just understand you are 40% into the AGI range. The, the range started at 100,000. So how much can Mario deduct? Well, total, how much did he deducted? Total of 30,000. The first 15,000 went against the 75. So we have 75,000 in losses. We used 15,000 immediately against the income. We're left with 60. Then for the remaining 60, we're able to take another 15. We just computed this 25,000 times 60%, a total of 30,000. Now we need to know what would, what would we have to do if we go from a passive activity to a active activity. So basically we had a passive activity. We'll go back to my farming example. Now I decided to be a farmer, okay? When a passive activity changes to, to an active activity, suspended losses from the years in which the activity was passive may be deducted against the income from the newly becoming an active activity. Now any losses suspended, now I can use them. Any remaining suspended losses is carried forward to offset future income from the formerly passive activity or income from the from other passive activity. So the good news is you don't lose them. If you change, if I decided to go back and be a farmer now, I just want to leave my job and be an active farmer rather than just own shares in a farm, then that will be the case. Let's look at an example. Over the previous three years, Lisa has owned an interest in a single passive activity. At the beginning of the current year, when Lisa's total suspended passive losses amounted to 50,000, she increased her hours of participation and she became a material participant in the activity. That's fine. She has 50,000 of losses. Lisa's share of the current year's income from the activity is 30,000. Well, guess what? Now I'm going to use those suspended losses and offset all my income of 30,000. And what happened to the remaining 20,000? Maybe carry it forward to offset future income, future income from this activity or income from other passive activities. So you really, it's a good thing if you decided to go from passive to active and you have suspended losses, that's not a bad idea. What should you do now? Go to Farhat Lectures and work MCQs and true false to help you understand this concept better. This is considered challenging for many students, CPA candidate as well as accounting students. Read your book, use your material, good luck, study hard and stay safe.